Okay, listeners, we are back at the art and science of coaching. I'm your host, Coach Tim Hall, and I have my sidekick, Coach Zach Gregg. Zach? Hey, hey. What's going on? You know, we've had uh, we've had a little bit of a break because we've been getting after it in our coaching profession and and just uh, you know having to focus on first things first. But want to get back in the groove here with the art and science of coaching and uh, and tackle a topic that that all bike racers at some point encounter mm-hmm. and just dive a little bit deep into. Uh, the topic and and explain upgrading upgrading from one level to the next one category to the next why upgrade and all the ins and outs of upgrading in all the disciplines and so that's something that you and I encounter quite a bit as cycling coaches uh, especially with young college athletes who are up and coming and going through the ranks and very ambitious. It's a discussion that we have quite often. And, and here we are uh, in the middle of 2021, getting to be late spring and we've had some races under our belt. And that's been a, a point of discussion with quite a few athletes. And so we thought it'd be appropriate to yeah, just have a deeper discussion on this podcast about uh, what all is involved. Because it's not a straightforward Uh, oh, I've won a few races and yeah, let's just upgrade. There's more to think about, isn't there? Yeah. And even, uh, even if you just looked on USA cycling, you'd think that it was a little bit more simple, uh, than it actually is. Cause there's, you know, now there's this big points matrix and they've simplified it a lot. Um, especially on the roadside, it used to be this like very convoluted thing where you think you got 10 points for your upgrade, but you got three, um, and so now they basically got a chart that says, if this many people are in your race, uh, you get this many points. And to get from your category three to your category two, you need 30 points from your cat one or cat two to cat one, you need 35. Um, then it kind of trickles down from there. Um, and they've done a great job with the, the changing of the cat five to the novice, you know, especially for some of our folks who are trying a new discipline who are already skilled bike riders. They don't have to get the 10 race starts anymore. So it's, it's come a long ways from when you and I had to climb the ladder. I remember uh, scrambling all over the place, trying to get those 10 race starts in. Uh, Cause I had the fitness. I just, you know, four plus hour drive every weekend just to get the race start. Um, but yeah. And then collegiate cycling kind of follows that same model where um, we, we are kind of attached to the category system in a way, but we also have our own categories where we start out with a C category rider and, um, and we move up to an A. And then I think in mountain biking, there's also D, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot to know. And it has evolved over the years. And I'm sure in, in another few years, it'll evolve again. Uh, but it's something that all racers, if, if, it, if this sport is something that you, you want to continue to do and do on a regular basis, you have to get uh, familiar and knowledgeable about what that process is like, what it takes uh, to get there. And I have to go back to uh, USA Cycling's website and refresh my memory all the time uh, to, to be uh, up to date on what those processes are, what the points are, and uh, because it's different for every level uh, and, and the requirements for that. But it's something that I think is uh, something for every cyclist to aspire to, whatever category you're in, we all begin at the same level. I think that's the beauty of this sport is that everybody can relate to one another in the sense that we started at the same spot. And right. we, we don't just jump to the pro rank or the cat one rank in any discipline. We start at that lower level and we work through the ranks. And, and that's something that everyone in uh, the sport of competitive cycling can relate to and can offer insight to and in, uh, in their experiences and how to do it. And you're right that going to the, you know, the amount of races you need to, to get these points and the traveling you have to do, it's a big investment to, to do it. And it's also, it could be a deterrent because you have to, to go to such great lengths. 
Yeah. And I know the, especially some of the mountain bikers have a lot of difficulty um, on the West coast where there are not very many USA cycling sanctioned races. So um, yeah, it is a little bit region dependent and discipline dependent on how easy it is to get to some of those things um, near us. Uh, the Winston-Salem and, and Raleigh area have fantastic weeknight crits that are sanctioned by USA cycling. So these guys have it made and they don't even realize it. Same thing in the DC area um, where they're able to get their upgrade points without uh, doing the, the four hour drive up 81 like I had to. Um, so yeah, it is on that aspect, a little bit regionally dependent on how accessible those race starts are uh, for the lower categories. Yeah. Midweek criteriums, midweek short track races, uh, midweek time trials, uh, things of that nature have really changed weekend racing dynamics. Uh, you've got, I, I mean, I, promoted a crit series in Nashville for a decade before coming to the mountains. And it's still going on back in Nashville. And you've got the driveway series down in uh, the Austin area. You've got uh, uh, the Charlotte area has uh, quite a few mountain bike series that they promote through the winter and, and springtime. So yeah, those are, are great events to get experience and to perhaps earn some points eventually that's gonna help you make that progression. And so what we're gonna talk about today is one, uh, why upgrade? What are, what, are, what are the reasons why you would want to upgrade? We're going to talk about our thoughts on uh, like, all right, what's the process and the flow that you need to be thinking about as you're doing that uh, and how a coach can affect and impact that process in a, in a really good way. Uh, we're going to talk about when is the best time to do it and when we think is maybe not the best time. Uh, and then also some uh, some challenges that you might go through along with what are some benchmarks, benchmarks for you as an athlete uh, to, uh, to aim for that's going to really help you make that decision is the time right for you to make that upgrade. And so uh, this whole process is, is really, you get right down to it, Zach, is it's the lifeblood of this sport, you know, without this upgrade process and the different categories because there's people who don't understand racing. They look at a race flyer and it's like, what are these categories? You go to a running race, there's no, you know, it's like right. a 5K, man. It's one big mass start. And it's a, a lot like I'd say a gravel race or uh, uh, a Fondo. It's a, hey, you all start together. But in competitive bicycle racing, we've got these different categories. And, uh, and so... You know, it's a it's a really important part of the success of this sport is having those distinctions in ability as well as experience. Yeah, totally. And yeah, there's there's nothing like trying to climb the ladder and and check how many points you have and and trying to get up to whatever category your friends are racing in or whatever category you need to be in to get to this big race or this next goal or things like that. So I think there is a lot of power in the category system. Um, as well as safety um, and forced experience for some younger riders um, because, you know, it's not a safe sport. And, you know, anytime we can introduce safety into it, I think it's valuable. Um, and you don't want people to have a bad experience, you know, having a, a category four racer with category one racer is not going to, neither of them are going to have fun <laughs> or, you know, have a good experience. So, um, yeah, I think the the real reason for me of why to upgrade is is like the continuing push towards progress um, and an increase in your ability. The you know it, I think some of the the obvious distinct distinctions in the different categories are just average speed in the races. You know, as you get faster, the speeds go up. Your your competition gets just as fast. You know, things happen uh, more quickly. And uh, everybody always wants to be there, right? They want to be in the, the fastest race with the strongest guys. And the only way to, you know, safely introduce them into those races is through this, this system that almost gates them into where they belong, not ne necessarily where they think they want to be. Um, so yeah, the, the push towards, you know, where you want to be is, is the real reason to upgrade. Yeah, big new challenges is key, you know, right. having a challenge ahead of you that's just tougher than what you're going through currently. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, uh, it can help motivate you through all the difficult training that you need to do uh, to prepare for, for the racing you're going to, to get into. I think something else about 
uh, why upgrade would be, uh, say you've been in this sport a little bit and you're a part of a team, and that is your teammates need you at that next level. You know, they need a little bit more depth in the roster to, to have one more rider who can cover a move or make an attack or uh, uh, have a lead out train or just someone to provide that presence because uh, presence gets overlooked in, in every shape of racing where it's fun. Isn't racing more fun when you look around? It's like, man, there's like five other people in my race with the same jersey as I've got. You know, there's strength in numbers, isn't there? Totally. And that, that extends to cyclocross and, and downhill and, and every discipline of cycling where that representation uh, matters and the, the ability for you and your teammates to have a conversation and experience the same things only raises everybody's level. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think that's really when you get down to it. You've heard me say this before that, I mean, the bicycle is just a tool. It's a tool for, for people to have relationships with. And, uh, and that whole camaraderie and fellowship element within the race itself, it just opens doors of dialogue where I know you and I, this past season, we've been uh, having team meetings uh, within a, an hour or more after all the races have happened that day. And we've had some really deep team discussions where everyone is talking about their experience and sharing that with one another and how valuable that is. I don't think that goes on enough uh, in club oriented situations that are you know, not like ours. We're a little bit unique with being a college team and, and the setting that we have, but that whole camaraderie element and your team needs you and, and you need the team, not, you know, right. it's, a, it's a symbiotic relationship, how important that is and how, how that will just keep you in this sport even longer. It's a lot less fun racing your bicycle when you're the only one wearing that jersey in that field and not to mention a heck of a lot harder right yeah and same thing if you're the wrong ability level <laughs> you know if, if you're too fast it's not fun for you it's not fun for anybody else um and if you're you know not skilled enough to be you know on that course in that race it's not fun so yeah i think upgrading to find where you belong in that moment and then working on the things that you need to work on in order to upgrade again or you know be competitive within their own race within that same race um is really motivating yeah well i know we've talked before about roles and uh and that's a whole other discussion another podcast about not only what are the various roles a teammate can play uh, in a race uh, but also uh, you know, what are the tools it takes to be successful as an athlete in this sport, as a team in this sport? Uh, another thing that kind of jumps to mind about why upgrade, and this is one of those knocks that you you kind of you kind of see in memes and uh, people joke at one another. And that is, uh, man, don't be a sandbagger. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't just flat out sandbag a category for years and years and years. You know, it just that doesn't do you any good. It's not uh, it's frustrating for other people. But, yeah, don't be a sandbagger. Nobody likes a sandbagger. No. And not there's even moments, a sandbagger. Yeah, you know, we, we, <laughs> we have uh, we're going to talk about, you know, when when are some times to do it. And when when mm. there's times to stay, there's legitimate reasons why you should uh, perhaps stay in a category for a while. We're going to talk about that later, but uh, yeah, nobody really enjoys a sandbagger. Uh, so don't be that, that person. Uh, it's, it's really discouraging for everyone else when, when, uh, when the outcome is almost sometimes already decided uh, and uh, you know, the time is right for that person to, to upgrade. So, okay. So I think we've discussed like what, why upgrade, what are the different scenarios? Why, why would you want to do that? Uh, the next thing is, and this is something that you and I encounter quite a bit in our profession, working with, with college athletes. And, and we have to remind them it's how important it is to, because like you alluded to earlier, the USA cycling system, uh, it's a point system according to the type of race, how many people were in the race, what position you finish. You got so many points attached. And it, it creates a scenario where a cyclist starts racing for points. And yeah, hash that out. What What is the argument against racing for points? 
Right. So I think the, the racing performance um, issue is when you start doing math in your head where, you know, how many, how many people can beat me um, and I still get enough upgrade points or, you know, what, what's it going to take? Oh, I'm, I'm good with third because I get six upgrade points or things like that. And it really distracts from your um, ability and your situational awareness when you're focusing on racing for the win. And those are the situations where you're actually going to, to learn more is uh, putting yourself in an opportunity to either win or lose um, and not, you know, get six points or three points kind of thing. Um, and yeah, that really gets lost on, on some people, especially when they're in the thick of it they've been, you know, racing and training and doing all this stuff and they're just grasping for those final points. It's very easy to play it safe when those are actually the opportunities where you're most experienced within your category and you should be going all in for either winning or losing. Um, we talk about this all the time. Um, even on, yeah, my team at a high level, it's like, man, why did you get sixth? It's, you know, we're, we're not, we're not in the market for minor placings. Um, and that goes all the way from, you know, the first time you race your bike to, you know, the top of the sport, the world champions, all that stuff. It's you race to win the bike race. Um, and I think that's important. And we have to remind people all the time of that because, you know, they want to climb the ladder to get to a place where they feel like they can make a bigger impact. Well, the biggest impact you can make is to win the race you're in, you know, and then if that doesn't go right, you win your group. Or, you know, if you go all in and it doesn't work, then you get 47th and it's fine because you grew a lot in that moment instead of settling for fifth place because you needed three points to upgrade. Mm. That's a great point. And you see it happen a lot. I, you know, the, the phraseology I always use is just race to race. What's the moment giving you race that moment and, and, and try to take yourself beyond that moment. You know, what is that opportunity that you have in front of you? Race the race. And if you're doing all the right things in your training and making good decisions in that race, then those points are going to come. They're going to naturally occur. You're going to get what you're supposed to get. And I love to, to tell our team and not that, you know, win, winning, winning is great and it's a validation and good results are validation. Uh, but I like what you said about, you know, win your group. Whatever group mm -hmm. you're in, it doesn't matter if you're racing for fifth or first or 25th. Be greedy. Be greedy because you're going to learn something through that experience. It's going to make you that much better. So race the race, race to your strengths, and, and then go beyond yourself some way, somehow, in a way that you haven't before. And, and yeah, don't go into any event and say, oh man, all I need is five more points and I can apply for the upgrade. And, and then, because what it does is that you then race to the lowest common denominator, right? And you will accept whatever's going on as long as there's this hope of you getting that placing you need for that thing, uh, for that upgrade. And so don't race for points. Those points will happen over time, race the race, race to your strengths and just push yourself. And, and over time, uh, you'll end up where, where you're supposed to be. Okay. So, all right. So there we touched on that. We, why upgrade race the race? Don't race for points. Now here's the biggest, the biggest key area I think, and that is, how valuable is experience? Let's like, man, the actual totality cumulative effect of racing experience, just how and, and, and what all that really means. Not just saying, well, I did, I've done 20 races or however many races, because the quality of those race experiences is what's really going to add up over time. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you see it all the time where people have been doing the, the points, uh, hunting or, or things like this, where they're, they haven't put themselves in, in the position to win the bike race, or they haven't put themselves in tight, hard, fast situations, and they haven't gained the experience that we're talking about. Um, and they get to the next category and they struggle. So that, that experience, um, you can't find it in a YouTube video. Cause I tried, you can't figure it out on your own training. Um, you can barely do it in a group ride. Um, those, you know, race defining moments, finding, you know, feeling out a situation where, oh yeah, this is the correct breakaway or, you know, I now understand how to move through the middle of the group because, you know, 
we're stuck in yellow line situations a lot of the time um, and they can't move up the sides or not that much space. All these things um, that you can only get in racing situations that not only make you a better racer, but also make you a safer competitor. Um, so yeah, I, I think the, the situation where you're almost mandated to do 20 or 30 races, even if you are super good, by the time you get to a category one level um, is super valuable because you can't fake it. Um, you have to, you have to fail in those situations to learn and you need to learn in order to be able to compete at the next level. Well, you, you've heard me say before, I'm a big believer in, you have to live it to learn it. There you go. And, uh, you and I can talk to, we're blue in the face, but, uh, there's no greater teacher than, uh, actual experience. And off more times than not, it's, it's a failed experience and that's what teaches you the most. And through that, you know, the key is, you know, to be bold, just be bold. You, it's okay to fail. Failure is, you and I, we're well accustomed to failure. We come from other sports where failure is like a daily thing. Like every single day, you're screwing up, making mistakes, losing, getting your butt kicked, but coming back the next day. And this sport is different in that, I, I've told this to you before about the struggle I had when I first got into cycling was I'd wake up on Monday mornings and it didn't matter if it was a good weekend. If it was a good weekend, I was, I was ready to race again, but I had to wait till the weekend, the next weekend to race. And then if it was a bad weekend, oh, talk about just frustration because I had to wait five, six days to race again. In our sport backgrounds, we would get to play the next day in lacrosse or baseball. And, and, and so you get to prove yourself right away. And it's tough in this sport to prove yourself number one, just in general, but then having to wait that in-between period between races where whether you failed or succeeded, it's tough to wait to that next opportunity to prove yourself, but be bold and daring. There's, there's something that I really enjoy what you or like what you say to, to our team uh, is that whatever category you're in, whatever race you're in, put yourself up there in the front and see what that feels like. Yes, expand on that a little bit. Yeah, so this actually came from uh, a coach I had a couple of years ago. So I went to Tour of America's Dairyland as a cat two and raced a pro race. And it was like this big thing. And he was like, man, every day you have to see the front of the race. And I was like, simple, not a problem. And so three days in, I had not even come close <laughs> to seeing the front of the race. And it got to the point where, you know, we had a pretty heated conversation about it. He was like, man, I don't care if you finish. You have to see the front of the race. You have to know what the speed is like and the like the level of difficulty involved in seeing the front of the race because you can't attack. You can't win. You can't get in a breakaway. You can't do all the fun things that you've talked about, dreamed about, heard about if you can't just get to the front of the race. Um, so especially, you know, uh, one of the things we'll talk about later is the big jump from a category three to a two and a two to a one on the road just from the speed and the, you know, the speed of decision-making and, and just the space uh, or lack of space. So uh, we have a lot of cat twos and cat threes on the team um, who are really good at uh, finishing races and they're strong and they're, you know, smart racers, but they're not in a position to help yet. And they're really, you know, they're really finding ways or wanting to find ways to contribute. And that progression looks like, find a way to get to the front of the race because you can't impact it if you're not there. Mm -hmm. um, and from that, then we can start talking about breakaways or leading teammates out or all the things that, you know, are, are really uh, shown to them as marks of exceptional teamwork um, that all start with being able to move, maneuver around a pack and get to the front of the race. So yeah. that's, you know, that's where we are. And I think over the last couple of weeks, especially, um, we've, you know, they've taken it to the heart and they've, they've understood that that's not a simple ask. Um, and it goes back to experience, right? You have to see the race a hundred times before you can actually read it and see what's, you know, understand what's going on. Yeah. Reading a race is one of those things that is really difficult to teach. It's also hard to 
because you can't get inside the minds of an athlete when they're in the race as to why are you positioned there versus here? Or why did you start at the back of the field when you could have started toward the front and things of that nature. And it's even tougher when you think about mass starts for mountain biking and cyclocross where uh, there there's call up procedures and mm -hmm. you're, you know, eight rows, 10 rows, 15 rows back, and you've got to fight through the field. Uh, it's tough to see the front of the race and, and know what that's like because the gaps get so big. So, but you have to keep going and you have to keep pushing yourself. I think one of the things that really helps people to gain experience uh, within a category is the various state, uh, local association, state points series that are available. Yeah, let's discuss that a little bit. Yeah. So um, I think most uh, regions, at least on the East Coast, and, you know, we talked about Tennessee having great um, regional uh, racing series, will have points associated with overalls for the entire racing calendar for a given year. Um, and those are, you know, great ways to track your progress within a category. So, you know, if you if you start the year as a category three, and you are able to do all the races within a year, as a category three, um, you should be able to see how you stack up against your competition based on those points. Um, and usually, you know, they'll go first to 10th place and they give them an inverse amount of points for their position. So first gets 10th and they track it through the whole year. Um, and then at the end, you know, somebody will be the overall leader. And I think, yeah, especially for people who had either upgraded in the off season and they're set in that category and that's, you know, where they belong and they're competitive and they're not just like, they didn't just win the first three races. Um, it's a great way to track their progress for, through a year. Um, I know that Mid-Atlantic has uh, Mabra um, Road Cup, which is very competitive um, on both guys on the girl side. Um, and then Virginia Off-Road Series, there's, you know, all kinds of different ones um, in Virginia for, for mountain bike and XC and the Enduro calendar is fabulous at this. <laughs> like yeah. Those guys will travel anywhere to get some points in the overall for the Enduro Series. Yeah, I love point uh, state or regional or or even just a promoter driven point series. I think those are are big motivators. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the NCCX for cyclocross here in the state of North Carolina. You know, uh, Texbra down in Texas. Yeah, oh, yeah. you mentioned Tebra uh, in the Carolinas for North and South Carolina. We have the CCA. If you're not familiar with the local associations that really are the driving force behind USA Cycling and putting on and promoting events. Without local associations, I don't know where our sport would be, or at least the administration of it in each mm -hmm. state. I mean, it would be in shambles. And, and I've served on the board of a local association uh, for, for quite a few years. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thankless job, but it's necessary. Uh, but they do a lot. So if you go to USA Cycling's website, yeah, go to the local association portion and find out what region you're in and learn more about the association and what point series uh, opportunities are available because they do them in every discipline and and they usually award jerseys and you know you, you there are awards attached to it and there's uh, yeah like you said a great way to rank yourself within a category and just sort of keep track over time uh, I've won a state jersey before that a, a series which is really cool and when I was first in the sport. And, uh, and I, you know, it was, it was fun. It kept me in it. It gave me a reason to go to races. And, and so, yeah, check that out. Uh, experience definitely is, is crucial. Uh, and, and I think one of the keys though, as you said early on is get in that race, whatever it is, and learn the art of just winning and losing in every situation possible. Mm -hmm. You know, try, don't do the same old, same old, you know, uh, just put yourself in every situation you can imagine, try it. It might work great. If it doesn't now, you know, but win and lose in every situation you can. Yeah. We don't, we don't need any more specialists. You know, <laughs> if, if you're a really good sprinter, try the long game, you know, um, you know, it could be, it could be your actual strength. You know, you never know in, until you try. So um, don't be a specialist until you're, you know, at a point where it's, it's the only way to win. So yeah, I would encourage everybody to try something different. Um, it, those week races or group rides, great, 
times to do the exact opposite of what you think you should be doing <laughs> um, and test your limits, you know, see what's, see what works, see what's really uncomfortable for you. Um, and that's how you're going to grow. Well, you know, and you, this is you saying that brings something to mind that I think about a lot, always have in the sport. Of course, I come from a background where you're keying off of someone's tendencies. Mm -hmm. Like what is someone's tendencies? If you're, if you're someone in this sport right now, you think I'm, I'm in this for the long haul. One, you're developing yourself. I want to encourage you to really begin to, to focus on the tendencies of other competitors, what they do, how they do it, when they do it, what are, what are they good at? What are they great at? What are they not so good at? Cause as you, as we talked about before your goal, you to be successful, you have to use your strengths against other people's weaknesses. How are you right. going to figure that out? It can't be just your strength and thinking, oh, I'm going to just take my strength to the line. No, you've got other people with their strengths. You've got your own weaknesses. And so if you can begin to accumulate this knowledge uh, and, and little black books, so to speak, where you're just you're keeping tally of uh, given athletes, uh, uh, like you said, their specialty. Uh, what is it that makes them special and unique and how can I beat them uh, in, in any given situation? So begin to really catalog all these racers that you compete against because you're going to see them every week. You're yeah. going to see them everywhere you go. So get to know them and the kind of riders they are because that can be something that can really help you push through and break through um, because now you have a, a, just a better understanding of who your competition is. And I think that's key. One of the key things within the experience is getting to know your competition. Don't just look at their results. Look at like how do they do it? What mm -hmm. do they actually do that helps them be in successful situations? I think that's a critical uh, aspect to that. Yeah, totally agree. All right, so knock that out. All right, now, Zach, how is it that a guy like you or me or another coach out there, how, where does a coach fit into this process? How can we be of service and of help to an athlete through the upgrade process? Yeah, I think we can offer some level of objectivity um, and benchmarking for our athletes where um, they can kind of relay their race experience to us and we can take out of that what they either need to work on or um, you know what, what they did well. And I think, you know, it's, it's also difficult for us uh, uh, almost training these folks on the verbiage to use and how to effectively relay what happened in their race um, so that they can paint us a picture and then we can provide feedback. So um, in those earlier categories, um, the, the lower categories, I think it's very valuable having someone almost lead you into certain questions and have you be able to answer that no I did not drink a full bottle in a three-hour race <laughs> no no I did not eat or fuel or position myself well or you know or yes I was very attentive and and you know followed this guy who is this the best guy in our category and you know we were able to form a breakaway and um I think leading uh leading uh athletes to appropriate answers and having them have their own sort of breakthrough um, in their understanding of racing. Uh, it's, it's only something that someone with that experience can really do. Um, we can also, yeah, on the benchmarking side before and after racing, um, say, you know, Hey, I want you to do th these three things during the race. You know, for most people it's eat, drink, get to the front. And, um, <laughs> and then afterwards you can have that discussion. How many of those do you do? Right. Two, two out of three, or yeah, I did all out of all three, you know, I, I, fueled, I was at the front, I had a great time. Um, you know, I, and then what did you learn? So, um, I think we can offer that sense. And then as, as they get more experienced and those, those moments become a little bit more divisive and, you know, the, the microscope is out instead of the magnifying glass or looking at just this big, broad picture, um, we can start having those, uh, those moments be like really valuable to their a racing uh, library of situations, intellect, whatever you want to call it. But um, yeah, at, at every level, we can offer some objectivity and some goals um, and prepare them and, you know, help figure out 
what they actually need to learn <laughs> and then teach them how to relay it to us. Yeah. Well, perspective. Yeah, Just sure. Really give that at bring that objective view, ask the right questions. And like you said, yes, the, if the answers, they need to come to their own answers, really. We can give advice and counsel, but it goes back to that. You, know, you have to live it to learn it uh, approach and that perspective that we can bring to them uh, to help them to better understand. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the other things is every, every athlete at some point, uh, especially a cyclist, it, that they're going to encounter obstacles. They're going to hit walls. They're going to get frustrated. They're going to scratch their heads and wonder, what in the why in the world am I? What's what's holding me back? And, and it's always us. We're always holding ourselves back in some way. It's not someone else. It's always us. And so what a what a coach can do is help you uh, overcome those obstacles and give you perspective on on what they've seen in the past and and what they have seen that works, what doesn't, but help you overcome and get through those obstacles that you're encountering because you're going to face them at some point. Some people, it, it may not happen until they get to the pro level or it might happen right away in the sport, you know, when you first start. Um, but you're going to encounter obstacles and a coach can, can help you maneuver through them, can talk you through them. Uh, you know, I'm a big believer in, in finding out where the edge of the cliff is. And sometimes you need to jump off that cliff as an athlete, you need to jump off and find out, you know what, can I land on my own two feet? And there's other times where you just need to get close and a coach can help you know the difference between those two moments. Like you said that your, your previous coach told you that you've got to go to the front of the race. You got to see what that feels like. You need to go there. Um, and so sometimes that's what we need. We need that voice of reason from an objective person to say, hey, yes, you can do this. Here's how you can do it. Try these things. Or, or, or sometimes as a coach, one of the replies I like to ask is, well, when I'm asked a question about a given thing is, well, what do you think? Right. You know, what do you think about it? It doesn't, when you get down to it, it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what you think and how you're going to process that and how you're going to feel about it. So helping a coach can help you overcome obstacles, give you perspective. And I love what you said about just that objectivity because we can be our own worst enemy. Uh, and we can also be our, our own best friend and we can treat ourselves the best, which is what we want to do, but we also can be uh, too tough on ourselves sometimes. And a coach can just say, hey, hey, you know, it's gonna be okay. And you're better than you think you are. Uh, and so, yeah, just um, helping athletes get through the, uh, the minefields of athleticism and sports and and how to overcome obstacles i think is a key element i know the coaches that i have had uh not just in cycling but in every sport boy they they've really that role alone right there has really helped me push through to various levels of the sports that i've been involved in definitely all right now let's say man you've done all these things and you, you race the race, you've got some results, got tons of experience and, you know, your coach is, is really guiding you in the right direction. Uh, all right. When do you do it? You know, when is the, when is the right best time? Uh, what are the considerations for when you do it? Cause it's not just a simple, ah, I got the points. I'm going to put the upgrade in and bam, then what? So what, what are the best times or what are the outcomes or situations of when to actually apply for the upgrade and what considerations should they, should they have? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I've always um, kind of split a typical road season into like three parts, right? So you get your off season, um, then you have the first half and then there's kind of a natural break in July and like mid August where it's just hot and miserable everywhere and nobody really wants to race. And then you've got kind of this fall season that's a couple months. Um, and so I always kind of recommend people to upgrade like either, you know, in, in the intermediary between those seasons, right? So if you're going to, uh, you've, you've got enough points and it happened at the last possible second in the year, you know, then you would upgrade the off season, um, which is really tough ask. It's probably, probably the most difficult way to do it. Um, and we'll go into that in a second, but, you know, ideally you would have a really strong first half of the year. Um, 
and then upgrade um, during that kind of like off middle of the middle of the summer off season and then have two or three months to race in that new category at the end of the year. Um, Cause that really helps calibrate your expectations going into your true off season where you can put down all this work and, you know, show up ready to rock and roll in that new category at the beginning of the year. So um, I think there is kind of a flow to it. I would not recommend just upgrading on a Tuesday and going to race on a Saturday um, unless, you know, you were just super ready for it. You know, there, there are some uh, guidelines on USA cycling where they just like mandatorily upgrade you because you've done so good in your category up to that point. Um, and if that happens to you, sure, man, just get after it, but that's not normal. Um, yeah. So is that kind of what you've been recommending? Yeah. And you know, I, I, uh, I agree with that. And, you know, if, if, if you're not in a position to where the middle of the season is, is right for you, then at least strive to try to put yourself in a situation where you can do it with a few races left at the end of the year, so, like you said, to get a taste of what it's like at the next level. And, and there's something to think about when it comes to, let's say you're a cat three and you want to get to a two, don't, don't get too uh, um, enamored by the fact that you're in these one, two, three races and think that you're ready because you finished a one, two, three race that you're ready to race at the one, two level. A one, two race is not the same as a one, two, three race. Uh, and I've even said the category twos, a, a pro one race is not the same as a cap, as a pro one, two race. They're very, very different and they're harder. There's, there's a difference in the competition level. And so if you can get that mid season or late season taste of the next level, whatever discipline or category you're, you know, you're going to be in, that's really going to help you through your training in the off season uh, to get ready for the next season uh, because it's going to just help you better identify what it takes to be competitive at the next level. And like you said, yes, I'm not a big fan of going through the whole year and upgrading in the off season without any insight as to what it really takes at the next level. You can do it. You're going to survive, but then you start the season with, with a lot of unknowns and that, 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 that creates anxiety when you get into the next level of racing and, and you know that everyone there is fast, they're strong and it's going to be difficult and it can be discouraging. It can be really discouraging to start a season in a new category for the first time. Uh, and so that's, that's why I say, and, and I and agree with you about getting some late season taste of that uh, and not letting these uh, large group categories like cat one, two, three races fool you into thinking that you're really ready um, because it, 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 it doesn't really doesn't really mean that you're ready. And I think it's even also tougher for women, right? Mm -hmm. When a lot of their races are, it's all the women together. You know, you've got sometimes pro uh, or cat one, two women racing with in a field of cat four or five women. And I know that that is, I, that's just incredibly difficult. It's very unfair. And uh, I'm not a fan of that at all. And I know the women are not. And so, uh, you know, kudos to the ladies out there who push through that and keep mm -hmm. keep racing no matter uh, what the scenario is in the field they start with. And so, uh, but yeah, you know, the timing of your upgrade is 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 something to consider. Uh, I'm not. I really don't like it when a forced upgrade is ha is is put upon someone. Uh -huh. I think, you know. Uh, the the regional official who makes that decision should be in contact with either that rider, the team, or the coach, and and learn like why is this person still in this category? We've had this in collegiate before, where hey, uh, we have enough people at the A team right now. Like you're you're we can't even add, we can't even put you in the race in the A field until we have some people graduate or don't race that weekend, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe. Uh, you're you're going to serve uh, someone else on your team. You know, this is something we're not even talking about the team. I, I've done this before in the past with a team, uh, a club team I had where this group of fours graduated to threes, then they graduated to twos together, but they stuck together the whole time. We didn't have people leaping up to the next level without their teammates coming with them. Yeah. So they would stay behind in the category to help prop up that other teammate 
and they all would come as a group. And boy, man, they had a ton of success uh, by doing that. And so, yeah, the timing of it, uh, the communication with the maybe even USAC officials to make sure that, hey, yeah, it looks like they're sandbagging, but they're not. They're there to help someone else uh, because we want for them to upgrade too. And so, uh, but yeah, I think that middle of the season, late season is the best time to do it. And, and that just sets you up for success the, the next year. So, all right, so we covered the timing. Um, and so last couple of things I want to talk about is, uh, you know, what, it's, it's tough to make breakthroughs, you know, mm -hmm. and there seems to be these, these pinch points where uh, in some spots of the process, you can get through pretty quick, but then you sort of hit these walls and it takes more time where the experience is more important than the actual results. Uh, so with it, within that, those breakthrough moments, where, where is it the toughest levels to break through? What are the benchmarks you know, that, that you need to sort of identify, benchmarks to get through the breakthroughs? Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so I think it's a, a little bit different for every discipline, but um, you know, the, I think one of the ones for, for like a cyclocross race is finishing on the lead lap in a one, two, three race. Um, that would signify that, you know, you, you belong, you're skilled, you're fast, you're well-rounded enough to compete um, at that level. And it would be totally fine to upgrade because, you know, in those situations, once you upgrade, you're locked in, man. And if you're not able to finish on the lead lap, then it's very difficult for you to get the same overall racing experience, you know, then you're racing for 47 minutes instead of 60. And it's just, it's a totally different race. Um, I think for, for XC it, and some of those, uh, the mountain bike and more skill oriented disciplines, um, it's a little bit more convoluted, but you know, for me, it was, it was not getting dropped on the downhills with the leaders, you know, being able to make that front group and having both the fitness on the uphills and the skill on the downhills, um, you know, in, instead of just, <laughs> my own experience was, yeah, I could keep up on the uphills and then I'd lose a minute and a half on the downhills. Mm -hmm. You know, I did not belong. I didn't like, I was not skilled enough to upgrade. Right. I wouldn't have contributed anything to a higher level race. Um, the big thing in on the road, I think is, is being able to move from the back to the front of the field and participate in the race, you know, forming a breakaway, uh, being part of a sprint finish where you're not, being a hazard <laughs> to people around you um, is actually a, you know, a, a true skill. Um, and that would, to me, you know, signify, yes, I'm, I'm ready to upgrade from a three to a two or a two to a one, you know, uh, winning local races and regional races uh, across any discipline is kind of my benchmark for upgrading to the, the highest category of racing in your discipline. Um, because the level is going to be so much higher at those marquee events, right? You don't want to send someone who's only, you know, had moderate success at the local stuff to a national championship. That's, that's a great way to spend a lot of money and be really disappointed. So um, those are kind of mine just off the top of the head. Yeah. Uh, that the process of going whatever level you're in of, Hey, you finished the race with the group. And then you're able to, you're in the top 50% or you're, you're always at the very front or you can race off the front. You know, it's time to, to go to the next level when you're always at the front and you can race off the front and you can be just, you may not be winning, but you can be part of the winning process. You're, you're affecting that outcome. And, uh, and so, you know, that, that timeline for all of us is different as to like how quickly you get to the next level. Cause usually when you get to the next level, it's like, Oh, Oh God, it's tough to be in the middle of the field here. Uh, we haven't even talked about the, the, the difficulty of positioning yourself. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And, and what that, that art and skill is like in any kind of race uh, you know, how, how that can make such a big difference, but yeah, that, that process of, those benchmarks of, oh, I'm hanging on at the back or I'm stuck in the middle and I just, I can't sustain that power at the front of the race. And then you get to a point where you can, you want to be the person that can always. And then, you know, all right, I'm, I'm probably going to be able, 
because being off the front in the Cat Four race is maybe going to have you hanging on in the Cat Three race. Right. You know, and and if you're at the front or winning Cat Three races, you're probably going to be a part in the middle or maybe at the front occasionally in a one two race, but uh, that takes time. And and it seems to me that oh, what I've witnessed is the the one the areas where it's tougher to really where you hit those walls, you know, those obstacles I talked about earlier is when you're going from a, a really cat three to a cat two. Mm-hmm. I think that is one big giant obstacle uh, of performance difficulty to get to that next level. Uh, Cause when you get there, it gets so much harder. You know uh, I think that's, that's a tough level to break through. And then to get that cat one upgrade to go from a, you're in the race with ones or pros but to actually get the upgrade from a from a two to a one is oh talk about just it took me years to be able to do that uh, and it took me a few years as as a three because of an injury but uh, yeah I think those levels begin to be the toughest ones to break through uh, just because the as you alluded to earlier it gets harder it gets faster the average speed is faster more people in your race are good and -hmm. there are specialists, you know, and so you need to target the right events for you. It's going to help you be successful. Not every race is suited for everybody, you know, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't go race. It just means, Hey, maybe look at that race differently. This is a race where I go help a teammate. This is a race where it's going to build strength. I'm just going to have fun. Uh, Lower your expectations in a race where, you know, Hey, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a person who can climb a five mile climb with the leaders. Well, maybe I shouldn't go in there thinking I'm on a top 10 or win this thing and just go and use it as an experienced strength builder. And right. so that's the level I think from three to a two. And then, yeah, if you aspire to get a cat one license, boy, the two to the one is even tougher. Yeah, I totally agree. And there's uh, yeah, that three to a two, I think is a huge jump because there's no more easy races. There's Yeah even your local stuff is going to be against people who've done this for a long time and are really good at it. So um, that's the one where I'm most hesitant, uh, especially with junior racers who are super strong or super savvy, but not necessarily complete riders. Um, That would be the one area where you really want to hold those guys back. Um, And the, you know, the USAC officials are great about letting them accumulate a gazillion points before pushing them through to the next level. Um, we could probably do a whole podcast on development, just, just talking about junior category three to a two, you know, um, because there's so much to it. And I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an adventure for, for those guys. And, and that's definitely the biggest jump. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that is, yeah, well, I'll come, I'm going to come to juniors here in, here in just a yeah. second, <laughs> just to touch on that a little bit more, because you bring up a great point and, and it's something that we've actually encountered quite a bit over the last month in the racing that we have been doing ourselves. And so, um, but yeah, these, these breakthroughs, uh, you know, they do get to be, you know, quite difficult. And, uh, but again, it's just, just another level. It's another obstacle to, to fight your way through and, and it's doable. And so, um, you know, but those are some things I think that uh, to just be aware of and, uh, and, and have a sense of like what it's really going to take uh, to do that. Uh, you know, one of the things that as you're, as I've also gone through this and thinking about this, and, and I'll, maybe we'll, we'll touch on the junior aspect here in just a second after I bring this up. There's something you said earlier, we're talking about, and we're talking about upgrades, but mm-hmm. Uh, a thought that just occurred to me is like, there are also moments when it is appropriate to downgrade. There are. Now, downgrading, boy, it it might hit the ego a little bit and your sense of, uh, I don't know what, it, you know, how someone mentally or emotionally can handle that. But I am well aware of many instances where uh, downgrading, is entirely appropriate and the the right thing to do. So mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if that is something that you, uh, no, no, I know you as a person hasn't, you have not encountered this, but maybe there's athletes you've worked with. Have you run into this yet? Only once or twice. And it wasn't with athletes. It was friends who have had 
yeah, uh, physical injuries, life events, things like that, yeah. who are the biggest fans of cycling and still want to compete and contribute to uh, a race. And, you know, the, the only way for them to do it is not to train more or, you know, Im improve physically. It's to downgrade. And, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with it as long as there's not some second handed uh, reason for doing it. Right. Um, Matt Clements <laughs> downgraded at one point. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just, yeah, life. Right. He's yeah. he's he was working a ton. And he still had a ton of love for the sport. He just couldn't compete at that high, high professional level, you know, in multiple disciplines like he used to. Yeah. Ordinarily, uh, if if you're if you're youthful, if you're younger, if you're say <laughs> under four, under under fifty, uh, it, an injury is involved. There's there's definitely s situations where an injury has really set you back, and you know, being at that next lowest category is definitely appropriate because one, the injury affected you too. your training going into things uh, may have been really difficult and, you know, you're not able to, to really hit your stride. Uh, you know, so yeah, so injuries are another thing. Uh, I, you know, another area that, that has come up and I'm aware of, I've got friends that have done this who, yeah, they have reached the, the age of 50 and they're cat one racers. You know, they grew up, they've been in this sport for 20, 30 years uh, raced in, in pro one at the pro one level and were fantastic, but now, Hey, they've got families, they've got jobs and, and they're 50 years old. And you know what? Being a cat one is uh, at 50 is I can tell you from firsthand experience, it's not like being a cat one in your twenties or thirties. Uh, and so, yeah, they downgraded to, to be able to do these various masters 50 plus cat three, four races and, 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 or just a, a cat three race. That's where that's where they're at in life. And I think it's entirely appropriate to do it. And if you if you can just sort of accept that that's where you are in your life and, and that's the thing to do, then do it. And there might be and I've had this happen where you downgrade because of life that you're going through, but then you reupgrade mm -hmm. and that's the right thing to do, too. So you can get back there. So don't ever feel like, man. Now, now listen, don't be downgrading just because you've been lazy. Yeah, <laughs> right? that does not count. You do not get to do that. There is no downgrading because of laziness. And I tell you what, isn't it funny how the category process, it keeps you honest. It does. It's like, hey, man, because uh, one of the things we talk about with these benchmarks is as you're upgrading, especially from, say, a three to a two, the miles go up. Yep. I mean, they go up big time. You do an extra big loop of that lap. On, on the road, on the rate, uh, road course, XC the race. Uh, now that XC race is another lap. You got to go up that climb one more time. Cyclocross, you got 15, 20 more minutes you got to race. And boy, there's, I tell you, I've told many people, whether it's a cross race or uh, say a mountain bike short track where that, that time you think, oh, well, my, my cyclocross race is 40, 45 minutes. 60 minutes is nothing. <laughs> or a 60 minute crit is nothing versus a 45 minute crit. And that extra 10 or 15 minutes is what will crack you into just a million pieces. Yep. And that's not to say, that's not even touching on the difference between a 60 minute pro one, two crit or a 90 minute pro one crit. Massive. Not even massive. the same discipline. <laughs> no, no, it's a different world. No. And so look at those benchmarks. Those are, those are benchmarks The what is on the race flyer. Hey, you've got an extra 20 miles to do in this race. Are you ready for that? Uh, so your preparation is going to be key, but those are some benchmarks to, to look at what is the next level doing? You know, what is the actual race asking of you? I've got to be ready for that. Mm -hmm. You know, those are, those are another uh, benchmark. So yeah, downgrading is appropriate. Look at these benchmarks. And, and so let's, uh, um, that let's oh, oh one other thing as racers are doing all this hey let's say you're having success be sure that you keep a running keep an updated race resume it, yep. you don't have to be a, an aspiring professional and you're going to make a slick pdf and send it to all the the top u23 teams or protein you don't have to go to that level but keep a running list of your race resume uh you know the result you got uh, the, the event, the date, 
what kind of race was it, how many were in the field, because that is an important distinction. Keep a running rate, uh, a running updated race resume, because when you do go seek that upgrade, you're going to need to know this information. You're going to have to input that. The system, the online system, isn't automatically going to just fill that in for you. You're going to have to put that in there yourself. So keep an updated race resume running at all times, and you'll find that that'll That'll make things easier for you when the time comes to upgrade. So, okay, last thing, uh, juniors. Uh, we're, let's not go deep into this, mm -hmm. but you know, let's let's definitely. I love what you said about uh, juniors getting their own race experience because I'm a big proponent of peer groups. You right. know, peer groups racing with one another, such as the collegiate kids. The collegiate kids are racing against collegiate kids. That's the beauty of collegiate. So you look around and you're like these people are like me. I'm I'm 19, uh, and the and the oldest usually the oldest person you're going to go up against is like 23, maybe 24. Uh, and so with juniors, this sport can really uh, really help them, or it can really damage them in a way where if they're constantly going up and competing with adults. Who are much more mature mentally and emotionally uh, and physically because juniors physically could be right there or above or ahead uh, there's lots of them but mentally and emotionally they're just not ready for everything that's going to be thrown at them yeah just maybe what are some things that a junior should think about and if you're a parent of a junior uh, what what considerations should you give yeah i like what you said about uh looking for opportunities where they're competing against people their own age. Um, I think more people are more race promoters are understanding the importance of that. Um, and having true junior fields that do maybe two thirds, the distance of a one, two, three race um, is really impactful, right? They get a full racing experience, but they're not out there for three and a half hours. Um, they don't need it, you know, um, where as, you know, then they, they can take those experiences and, you know, if they're having success at that level, then they can move into the, the true category racing and, and see where they stack up. But having those experiences against their own peers um, is really important. Um, they don't really put category limitations in those junior fields, um, which is one of the reasons, you know, that sometimes they're all spread out across the road or, you know, juniors might want to do the one, two, three races um, instead. But yeah, having those opportunities to learn um, how to associate with one another. Um, and, you know, like we're always talking about playing, playing different roles within that, um, within that race, right? When, when they do a one, two, three race, they don't need to lead it out. They don't know that, you know, in the final, they need to keep it fast. Otherwise, everybody's just going to get all bunched up and, and do whatever. But then in a junior race, since no one really has a good grasp on these roles, it does get a little bit more chaotic and, you know, disorganized and more of a free for all. But if they're not expecting that, then, you know, they go to these national level events and they're just not uh, anticipating that happening. And, you know, it, it, they're not as prepared as, as some of the others. So um, yeah. yeah I think one of the, one of the constant things you hear uh, at the highest level of junior racing is that this, those kids, they have such an ability to recover and go hard again, again yeah. and again and again, that it's just, oftentimes it's, it's some of the fastest average speed races mm -hmm. because they just go hard until they can't go hard anymore. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and when you're, you're, you're young, you're young and, and you just don't, like you said, don't know these different roles and, and the depth of the field and, and the, uh, the teamwork that it takes at the higher levels in these categories may not be uh, applied in the junior ranks. Uh, you know, th those are things that they need to learn, but yeah, I agree. I think the one area of the sport where they're really doing a good job at this though, is in NICA, you know, the NICA, yeah. the NICA series at, in the state levels and the different categories that they have and the way they do it really helps people to be within their peer group. Uh, and they're very supportive of, of riders, mental, emotional, physical development, and it really keeps things in check. And I just feel like, uh, you know, you want, we want to, we want to help all the young kids come along in this sport the best way. And it's kind of tough when, you know, you get into these higher level races and the kid, you know, a young kid is strong enough. It's clearly mm -hmm. strong enough, but then maybe they're not ready for, uh, 
the just the physical miss it takes to be in a race like that. Right. Uh, you're, you're a grown man. I'm a grown man. And or you say you're a young lady and, and you're you're going up against grown, mature women and the conversations that we have. And and it's not that we are out there intimidating our components, but uh, but our size, our stature, our demeanor, all those things really play a part in the experience. And I think the more we can have kids racing against kids and old men like me racing against other old men and 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 the true, you know, the heart of the sport, uh, you know, the youth, uh, just the, yeah, the different peer groups racing against peer groups, I think is critical to the development and long term uh, sustainability of the sport, but also the length of time that someone's going to stay in this sport. I think it right. plays a big role in it. And, and, you know, because we often say, you hear this said at, at races, that, you know, how juniors is the future of racing. And, and to, I partly agree with that. I don't, I don't agree with it entirely, to be honest with you. Um, just because the system and the, the way that junior racing is set up, it forces them into the situations where they're racing against you or they're racing against me. And it's not really good for them in this moment when they're 15 to 18 years old or younger. And right. so we have to do a, jo a better job as a sport. I think this is where collegiate is a sweet spot. Collegiate is such a sweet spot for these young kids. If they would just gravitate to collegiate, they would then really begin to take off because they're racing against their true peers. And that's why NICA is being successful with what they're doing. Uh, I'd like to see our sport be able to do that uh, with juniors better. Uh, I don't, I, I have some ideas on how to do it. it, it it's a kind of harsh probably to, to maybe do that because then you would force juniors into junior racing instead of category racing. I'm a little uncomfortable with that too. So there's got to be a better way though. I think everyone should agree. There's got to be a better way to really prop up these juniors and grow juniors where we go to a race and we were racing this past month in mm -hmm. pro one, two, three fields that had a hundred to 150 people in it. Well, the junior field had maybe 20, but a lot of them were racing also in the one, two, three field. Well, how great would it be if that junior field had 75 to hundred to 150 while a completely set, a different group of people were racing in the one, two, three field. I think right. where, that's where we need to go. That's what needs to happen. And, and it all, it all gonna, is going to start in how we really treat these kids when they're younger and how we really foster their development, not just juniors, but then pull them into the collegiate ranks and help them grow and develop around their peer group. And then if we did that, I just think they would, you know, get into their mid twenties and be crushing people. <laughs> Totally. They, they would be crushing people. So anyway, all right, man, we have, I think we touched on just about everything there is to talk about when it comes to upgrading. Have we forgotten so. anything? I don't think so. I don't Somebody will tell us. <laughs> yeah. We will hear from somebody who says, oh, but you didn't talk about such and such. And Hey, if we miss out on something, uh, we'll talk about it later on. But all right. Well, there's a lot to digest there about upgrading and all the different aspects to it. Uh, I hope you're able to take away uh, from this something for yourself. Uh, you know, we go into these podcasts and uh, discussions knowing full well that not everything we say is for everybody and that maybe uh, you've already been through this or digested that, but hopefully there's at least one or uh, two or three things that you can take and go, oh, all right, I hadn't thought about that and apply it for yourself to help yourself get better, get to the next level uh, uh, and grow in the sport and stay in the sport. That's the real key is that you, you stay in this sport uh, for as long as possible and get out of it what you need to uh, get out of it. So, all right, Zach, that was a good one. It's in the books. I believe so. Yep. Okay. All right, folks. Thanks for tuning in to the art and science of coaching until next time adios see ya all right